Okay, tonight I will combine a couple of suttas. Please listen the first portion of it. Accompanied by loving kindness, Sanyutta Nikaya, Bojanga Sanyutta Mahavagga. In Bojanga Sanyutta you find 54.4. This is Metta Sahagata Sutta. It's also called the Halidvasana Sutta. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the Kolians, where there was a town of the Kolians named Halidvasana. So that's how the Sutta got its name. Then in the morning, a number of bhikkhus dressed and taking their balls and robes entered Halidvasana for arms. Then it occurred to them, it is still too early to walk for arms in Halidvasana. Let us go to the park of the wanderers of other sects. Then those bhikkhus went to the park of the, the wanderers of other sects. They exchanged greetings with those wanderers and when they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, sat down to one side. The wanderers then said to them, Friends, the ascetic Gautama teaches the Dhamma to his disciples thus, Come, bhikkhus, abandon the five hindrances, the corruptions of the mind that weaken wisdom, and dwell pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness, likewise the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter, thus above, below, across, and everywhere, and to all as to oneself, dwell pervading the entire world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, vast, exalted, measureless, without hostility, without ill will. Dwell pervading one quarter with the mind imbued with compassion, likewise the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter, thus above, below, across, and everywhere, and to all as to oneself, dwell pervading the entire world with the mind imbued with compassion, vast, exalted, measureless, with the mind imbued with altruistic joy. Likewise the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter. Thus above, below, across, and everywhere, and to all as to oneself, dwell pervading the entire world with the mind imbued with altruistic joy, vast, exalted, measureless, without hostility, without ill will. Dwell pervading one quarter with the mind imbued with equanimity, likewise the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter, thus above, below, across, and everywhere, and to all as to oneself, dwell pervading the entire world with the mind imbued with equanim equanimity, vast, exalted, measureless, without hostility, without ill will. We too, friends, teach the Dhamma to our disciples thus, come and do all that stuff. Then those bhikkhus neither delighted nor rejected the statement of those wanderers. Without delighting in it, without rejecting it, they rose from their seats and left, thinking, we shall learn the meaning of this statement in the presence of the Blessed One. So there is some comparison going on in here. Then, when those bhikkhus had walked for arms in Halidavasana and had returned from the arms round, after their meal, they approached the Blessed One. Having paid homage to him, they sat down to one side and reported to him the entire discussion between those wanderers and themselves. The Blessed One said, Bhikkhus, when wanderers of other sects speak thus, they should be asked, Friends, how is the liberation of the mind by loving kindness developed? What does it have as its destination, its culmination, its fruit, its final goal? 
How is the liberation of the mind by compassion developed? What does it have as its destination, its culmination, its fruit, its final goal? How, how is the liberation of the mind by altruistic joy developed? What does it have as its destination, its culmination, its fruit, its final goal? How is the liberation of the mind by equanimity developed? What does it have as its destination, its culmination, its fruit, its final goal? Being asked thus, those wanderers would not be able to reply and further, they would meet with vexation. For what reason? Because that would not be within their domain. I do not see anyone because in this world with its devas, Mara and Brahma, in this generation with its ascetics and Brahmins, its devas and humans who could satisfy the mind with an answer to these questions except the Tathagata or a disciple of the Tathagata or one who has heard it from them. And how because is the liberation of the mind by loving kindness developed? What does it have as its destination, its culmination, its fruit, its final goal? Here because a bhikkhu develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness accompanied by loving kindness. And then all seven factors of enlight enlightenment dot dot dot. So the last one is the enlightenment factor of equanimity accompanied by loving kindness. Based upon seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, maturing in release. If he wishes, may I dwell perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive. He dwells perceiving the repulsive therein. If he wishes, may I dwell perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive. He dwells perceiving the unrepulsive therein. If he wishes, May I dwell perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive, and in the repulsive, he dwells perceiving the repulsive therein. If he wishes, may I dwell perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive, and in the unrepulsive, he dwells perceiving the unrepulsive therein. If he wishes, avoiding both the unrepulsive and the repulsive, may I dwell equanimously mindful and clearly comprehending, then he dwells therein equanimously, mindful and clearly, clearly comprehending, or else he enters and dwells in the deliverance of the beautiful. This is called Subha Vimukha. When you start to see everything as beautiful, this is a place where you feel that your mind is developed to appreciate the beauty in the ugliest thing ugliness also in the beautiful thing like your human body we take it as a beautiful thing but also see the non, not so beautiful nature of it you have the equanimity developed in your practice um, to the extent necessary for you to not be shaken with this seeing that you are experiencing so when you go to the bathroom and you want to admire the feces, this is nothing wrong with you. It's your mind is perceiving the beautiful in the ugliest stuff that the mind sees. Nothing wrong with it. Or else he enters and dwells in the deliverance of the beautiful because the liberation of mind by Loving kindness has the beautiful as its culmination, I say, for a wise bhikkhu who here who has not penetrated to a superior liberation. I will explain what is beautiful after reading what the Buddha says next. And how bhikkhu in the lib is the liberation of the mind by compassion developed? What does it have as its destination, its culmination, its fruit? its final goal here because a bhikkhu develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness accompanied by compassion and then all seven factors of 
awakening uh, ending with the enlightenment factor of equanimity accompanied by compassion based upon seclusion dispassion and ces and cessation maturing in release with the complete transcendence of perceptions of forms this th they are also you see seen the beautiful and uh, repulsive and stuff so i'm going to skip that part or else with the complete transcendence of perceptions of forms with the passing away of perceptions of sensory impingement with non attention to perceptions of diversity aware that space is infinite he enters and dwells in the base of the infinite infinity of space because the liberation of mind by compassion has the base of the infinity of space as its culmination i say for a wise bhikkhu here who has not penetrated to a superior liberation so he gives a hint that there is further escape he also tells that compassion leads to infinite space so if compassion leads to infinite space what did loving kindness leads to mm. to the states before and that means up to fourth jhana like in the first on the first day i mentioned that loving kindness has this one quality out of 11 which is it tranquilizes your mind quickly tuatang chittang samadhiyati that means you can enter jhanas very quickly when your mind is free from aversion hatred frustration when you know how to hold things in your heart with that loving kindness instead of blaming stuff or anything it's such a pure state of mind so your mind enters into samadhis tranquility states stillness and your mind begins to open like a lotus opening and each layer has some beauty into it and you just become aware of it so then what does what is left here is um altruistic joy and we will find out what it leads to and how because is the liberation of the mind by altruistic joy developed what does it have as its destination its culmination its fruit its final goal here because a bhikkhu develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness accompanied by altruistic joy and then all seven enlightenment factors ending with the enlightenment factor of equanimity accompanied by altruistic joy based upon seclusion dispassion and cessation maturing in release so then see in the repulsive and and un, in the unrepulsive that part is there or else by completely transcending the base of the infinity of space aware that consciousness is infinite he enters and dwells in the base of the infinity of consciousness because the liberation of mind by altruistic joy has the base of the infinity of consciousness as its culmination i say for a wise bhikkhu here who has not penetrated to a superior liberation so that joy that you cultivate the altruistic joy modita is not wasted and you are mindful of it you let it be and you radiate it share it with all beings and you end up freeing your mind to the extent that it lands or it just falls into um infinity of consciousness and that will be the culmination of it how because is the liberation of the mind by equanimity developed what does it have as its destination its culmination its fruit its final goal here because a bhikkhu develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness accompanied by equanimity and then all seven factors ending with 
enlightenment factor of equanimity accompanied by equanimity. You now this is a sublime state working together with an enlightenment factor. Okay, one is a sublime state which you radiate and when when it is a factor of enlightenment that it suppose supports your enlightenment that your mind remains in equanimity without with or without you radiating it then it is just this enlightenment factor of equanimity so you can radiate or you can so what it says is develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness and the enlightenment factor of equanimity accompanied by equanimity based upon seclusion dispassion and cessation maturing in release continue being aware continue radiating so th all that is doing something here and then you can dwell seeing the perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive and so on or else you dwell therein equanimously mindful and clearly comprehending that is happening or else by completely transcending the base of the infinity of consciousness aware that there is nothing he enters and dwells in the base of nothingness because the liberation of mind by equanimity has the base of nothingness as its culmination i say for a wise bhikkhu here who has not penetrated to a superior liberation so then what is left is neither perception nor non perception and that is also possible so does metta lead to nibbana nothing leads to nibbana it actually gradually takes you on that road and it culminates in very much in um, this nothingness state but you know how to progress it does actually it is onward leading and it takes you to neither perception nor non perception not even perceiving that as a base and when you completely let go of that the cessations cessation in the singular is experienced and you come out of it and you develop further this passion for the letting go of um, lust hatred and delusion until um, you are completely free until you are aware that there is nothing more to be done and that you have true knowledge all those factors are cultivated so bookmark your questions i am going to switch to um i will come back to this book i want to talk about some uh, because some of you have been asking about buddha's how we perceive the buddha and i briefly mentioned yesterday that one way to perceive him that he is uh, one of the most beautiful expressions of the universe but that is not enough so we will go to maha satchaka sutta that is madhyama nikaya 36 where this person visits the buddha um thus have i heard on one occasion the blessed one was dwelling at vesali in the great wood in the hall with the peaked roof so great wood is mahavana um hall with the peaked roof is called kuta garasala now on that occasion when it was morning the blessed one had finished dressing and had taken his bowl and outer robe desiring to go into vesali for arms then as satchaka the niganta's son was walking and wandering for exercise he came to the hall with the peak roof in the great wood the venerable ananda saw him coming in the distance and said to the blessed one venerable sir here comes satchaka the niganta's son a debater and a clever speaker regarded as by many as a saint he wants to discredit the buddha dhamma and sangha it would be good if the blessed one would sit down for a while out of compassion 
The Blessed One sat down on the seat made ready. Then Satchaka, the Niganta's son, went up to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Master Gautama, there are some recluses and Brahmins who abide pursuing development of body but not development of mind. They are touched by bodily painful feeling. In the past, when one was touched by bodily painful feeling, one's thighs would become rigid, one's heart would burst, hot blood would gush from one's mouth, and one would go mad, go out of one's mind. So then the mind was subservient to the body. The body wielded mastery over it. Why is that? Because the mind was not developed. But then there are those who develop the mind, but they don't have control of the body. He says that here. Um, and the Buddha asks, but what have you learned about development of body? Well, there are, for example, Nanda, Vacha, Kisa Sankicha, Makkali Gosala. They go naked, rejecting con conventions, licking their hands, not coming when asked, not stopping when asked. They do not accept food brought or food specially made or an invitation to a meal. They receive nothing from a pot, from a ball, across a threshold, across a stick, across a pestle, from two eating together, from a pregnant woman, from a woman giving suck, breastfeeding, from a woman in the midst of men, from where food is advertised to be distributed, from where a dog is waiting, from where flies are buzzing, they accept no fish or meat, they drink no liquor, wine or fermented brew, they keep to one house, to one morsel, they keep to two houses or two morsels. When they go on arms round, they only visit one house and they go back. If they didn't receive anything, that's it. So one morsel is that they just receive just a bite of food and they go back. So just taking extreme self-modification into uh, seriously into their practice and that is what they did. This is called body development those days. They keep to seven houses or seven morsels. They live on one saucerful a day or two saucerfuls, saucerfuls a day on seven saucerfuls a day. They take food once a day, once every two days, once every seven days, thus even up to once every fortnight. They dwell pursuing the practice of taking food at stated intervals. But do they subsist on so little? Buddha asks. No, Master Gautama, sometimes they consume excellent hard food eat excellent soft food, taste excellent delicacies, drink excellent drinks, thereby they again regain their strength, fortify themselves and become fat. So what they earlier abandoned, uh, uh, they later gather together again. That is how there is increase and decrease of this body. But what have you learned about development of mind? So the, he, he's asking about Buddha's mind development. No, no. So Buddha is asking him about uh, development of mind. When Satchaka, the Niganta son, was asked by the Blessed One about development of mind, he was unable to answer. Then the Blessed One told him, what you have just spoken of as development of body Aggivesana, so his clan is Aggivesana, is not development of body according to the Dhamma in the Noble One's discipline. Since you do not know what development of body is, how could you know what development of mind is? Nevertheless, as to how one is undeveloped in body and undeveloped in mind and how developed in body and developed in mind, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, Satchaka, the Niganta's son, replied. 
um, the blessed one said this. So Niganta is actually um, the naked ascetic tradition is a branch of them or Shwetambara, they wear white clothes. So they, um, they lived in, they still live in the Indian society very closely in contact with uh, what Buddhist monks did and some often challenging them, um, especially about psychic abilities. <coughs> um, so then the Buddha explains uh, what is the development of the body and what is the development of the mind. Um, that means um, just basics about res sense restraint. I am going to skip that part because you already know, know that part. <coughs> So after saying that, uh, uh, this pa person says, I have confidence in Master Gautama, thus Master Gautama is developed in body and developed in mind. Surely your words are offensive and discourteous, but still I will answer you. Since so, he's, so, so this, this statement that he made about the Buddha is actually not knowing anything about the Buddha just to judge and uh, uh, like making weird faces, so that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> the Buddha says, since I shaved off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and went forth from the home life into homelessness, it has not been possible for a rise and pleasant feeling to invade my mind and remain or for a rise and painful feeling to invade my mind and remain. Has there never arisen in Master Gautama a feeling so pleasant that it could invade his mind and remain? Has there never arisen in Master Gautama a feeling so painful that it could invade his mind and remain? Why not, Agivesana? Here, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I thought, household life is crowded and dusty. So the Buddha is talking about those pleasant feelings he abandoned in terms of lust, hatred and delusion that he kept on the bay. But he didn't know the true nature of them. But he still he experienced meditation pain and he explains all that here. Here, Agdivesana, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, bodhi means enlightenment, sattva is a being, a being who is aspiring to be awakened. I thought, how so life is crowded and dusty? Life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy, while living in a home, to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Later, while still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life, I went forth and he explains all that um, in uh, Sutta 26. I will go to that Sutta, uh, maybe now. 26 is on 253. So later, while still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life, though my mother and father wished otherwise and wept with tearful faces i shaved off my hair and beard put on the yellow robe and went forth from the home life into homelessness having gone forth in search of what is wholesome seeking the supreme state of sublime peace i went to alara kalama and said to him friend kalama i want to lead the holy life in this dhamma and discipline alara kalama replied the Venerable One may stay here. This Dhamma is such that 
a wise man can soon enter upon and abide in it, realizing for himself through direct knowledge his own teacher's doctrine. I soon quickly learned that Dhamma, as far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of his teaching went, I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claimed, I know and see, and there were others who did likewise. So his mind was not invaded by lust and hatred, but delusion, of course, he has not completely uh, understood everything yet. So he can tell that his mind can go into, enter into these states easily just by hearing it. So he took it seriously and also practiced with them here. I considered uh, it is not through mere faith alone that Alara Kalama declares, by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I enter upon and abide in this Dhamma. Certainly, Alara Kalama abides knowing and seeing this Dhamma. Then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, Friend Kalama, in what way do you declare that by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge, you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma. In reply, he declared the base of nothingness. I considered not only Alara Kalama has faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Suppose I endeavor to realize the Dhamma that Alara Kalama declares. He enters upon and abides in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. I soon quickly entered upon and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. Then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, Friend Kalama, is it in this way that you declare that you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge? That is the way. Friend, it is in this way that I also enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. It is a gain for us, friend. It is a great gain for us that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. So the Dhamma that I declare, I enter upon and abide in by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. In the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. So, so you know the Dhamma that I know, and I know the Dhamma that you know. As I am, so you. As you are, so I am. Come, friend, let us now lead this community together. Like, come join as a teacher. <coughs> Thus, Alara Kalama, my teacher, placed me, his pupil, on an equal footing with himself and awarded me the highest honor. But it occurred to me, this Dhamma does not lead to dis disenchantment or to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. So Nibbana is like complete ending of fire of lust, fire of hatred and fire of delusion. So he realized that he can, anyone can fall back into those states. So he was seeking that escape here. <sighs> but not only to reappearance in the base of nothingness, not being satisfied with that Dhamma, disappointed with it, I left. So he actually touched nothingness. I may have mentioned um, infinite space by mistake, by being forgetful here. So nothingness is... Uh, very close, right? <laughs> yeah. Still, in search of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to Uddhaka Ramaputta and said to him, Friend, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and discipline. So, <clears throat> the same repetitions go on here. Uh, So he says uh, he enters uh, 
he declared the base of neither perception nor non-perception and he entered it and he was appointed as a teacher for the, the group but the Bodhisattva realized that that is not the escape he was looking for. Still in search because of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I wandered by stages through the Magadhan country until eventually I arrived at Uruvela in Senani Gama. There I saw an agreeable piece of ground, a delightful grove with a clear flowering river with a pleasant smooth banks nearby and nearby a village for arms resort. I considered this is an agreeable piece of ground. This is a delightful grove with a clear flower flowing river with pleasant smooth banks and nearby a village for arms resort. This will serve for the striving of a clansman intent of striving. So this will be good for meditation. And I sat down there thinking this will serve for meditation. So I'll go back to the other sutta to uh, discuss about self-mortification he did. It doesn't say here that he did six years of self-mortification. He went search of truth to Alarakala, Muddhakarama Putta, so it's just a traditional belief that he did self-mortification for six years. So we will find out. <coughs> uh, I thought uh, suppose I practice breathingless meditation. So I stop the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears. While I did so, there was a violent burning in my body, just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals. So too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears, there was a violent burning in my body. So he did this practice because he wanted to um, purify both his body and mind and his body and mind was already somewhat purified but he did not see that passion is completely eliminated so he wanted to burn it. So while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears there was a violent burning in my body but although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. So he could bear with because equanimity was strong in him. Now when deity saw me, some said, the recluse Gautama is dead. Other deities said, the recluse Gautama is not dead, he is dying. And other deities said, the recluse Gautama is not dead nor dying, he is an arahant, for such is the way arahants abide. So the concept of arahants was there at the time. I thought, suppose I practice entirely cutting off food. Then deities came to me and said, Good sir, do not practice entirely cutting off food. If you do so, we shall infuse heavenly food into the pores of your skin and you will live on that. I considered if I claim, claim to be completely fasting while these deities infuse heavenly food into the pores of my skin and I live on that, then I shall be lying. So I dismissed those deities saying, there is no need. I thought, suppose I take very little food, a handful each time, whether of bean soup or lentil soup or veg soup or pea soup. So I took very little food, handful each time. While I did so, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation. Because of eating so little, my limbs became like the jointed segments of 
vine stems or bamboo stems you've seen the self modification statue or images of the buddha because of eating so little my backside became like a camel's hoof because of eating so little the projections of my spine stood forth like corded beads because of eating so little my ribs jutted out as gaunt as the crazy rafters of an old roofless barn because of eating so little the gleam of my eyes sank far down in their sockets looking like the gleam of water that has sunk far down in a deep well my scalp shriveled and withered as a green bitter gourd shrivels and withers in the wind and sun my belly skin adhered to my backbone thus if i touch my belly skin i encountered my backbone and if i touch my backbone i encountered my belly skin if i defecated or urinated i fell over on my face there if i tried to ease my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands the hair rotted as at its roots fell from my body as i rubbed now when people saw me some said the recluse gotama is black other people said the recluse gotama is not black he is brown other people said the recluse gotama is neither black nor brown he is golden skinned so much had the clear bright color of my skin deteriorated through eating so little i thought whatever recluses or brahmins in the past have experienced painful racking piercing feelings due to exertion this is the utmost there is none beyond this and whatever recluses and brahmins in the future will experience painful racking piercing feeling due to exertion this is the utmost there is none beyond this and whatever recluses and brahmins at present there is none beyond this but by this racking practice of austerities i have not attained any superhuman states any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones could there be another path to enlightenment i considered i recall that when my father the sakyan was occupied while i was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree so there was this plowing ceremony and he was a little child sitting under a tree under a rose apple tree it's called jambu tree it's called ja- in india it's called jambu deepa because they have those trees and jambu fruits there it's called rose apples beautiful different fruit shapes quite secluded from sensual pleasures secluded from unwholesome states i entered upon and abided in the first jhana which is so as a child he enters the first jhana which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion could that be the path to enlightenment then following on that memory came the realization that is indeed the path to enlightenment i thought why am i afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and wholesome states i thought i am not afraid of that pleasure since i have it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and wholesome unwholesome states i considered it is not easy to attain that pleasure with a body so excessively emaciated suppose i ate some solid food some boiled rice and porridge and i ate some solid food some boiled rice and porridge now at that time five bhikkhus were waiting upon me thinking if our recluse gotham achieves some higher state he will inform us but when i ate the boiled rice and porridge the five bhikkhus were disgusted and left me thinking the recluse gotham now lives luxuriously he has given up his striving and reverted to luxury <clears throat> so he had five friends supporting in supporting him in wrong view saying that don't eat at all 
you will be the enlightened one. Kondanya Vapa Bhadya Mahanama Asaji. These five were the companions. And we will meet, meet them later. <coughs> so, your friends are going to abandon you sometimes, like they did. They are the ones who discourage you first. <laughs> when you try to build your material empire or spiritual empire. It doesn't matter <laughs> what it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I, uh, when I had eaten solid food, see, eating moderately and regaining your health is very important. Regain my strength, then quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana which, you know, he explains the jhanas here. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I declared, it, I directed it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. I recollected my manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, and so on. Thus, with their aspects and particulars, I recollected my manifold past lives. It's called, there's a book called Many Mansions, and it's very famous. Uh, Edgar Casey. It's about people experiencing past lives and revealing to this uh, therapist, I think, uh, some, someone who did hypno hypnotherapy. Um, this book is famous in Sri Lanka. It's, um, called, it's translated as Sansara Mandira by a by a monk. So, uh, <coughs> so he started, you know, so y look at this wording here, when my concentrated, so he did the four, four jhanas here, and then he, he, he reasons out, when my, mi when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imp imperfection, malleable, wield, wieldy, steady, that means there is equanimity. If you see a very horrible um, car accident, and that is how you died in a previous life, you can contain, you can still see it, because your mind is steady and full of equanimity here. <coughs> and the mind attained to imperturbability. This is called ananja in Pali. Very uh, fine transcendent transcendental state that you can some some it's like a clay that you can mold anything you, you know you want with this so he can now direct his mind he can tell what to do <laughs> to his mind until then mind tells us what to do <laughs> This was the first true knowledge attained by me. So these are called three Vedas, three knowings. Compared to the three Vedas, the Brahmins practiced. Buddha highlighted these three as the three knowledges. Some attained these, some did not, but still attained awakening, attained arahantship. And then I directed my mind to knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. This was the second knowledge attained by me. I directly, I directed it to knowledge of the destruction of the defilements. I directly knew, as it actually is, this is the suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. These are defilements, this is the origin of defilements, this is the cessation of defilements, this is the way leading to the cessation of defilements. When I knew and saw this, my mind was liberated from defilements of sensual desire, from the defilement of being, like wanting to exist in any realm uh, or habitual tendencies, from the defilement of ignorance, there is no more to be seen. I directly knew that it was liberated. There came the knowledge it is liberated. I knew birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. 
what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Okay. So then the Buddha says, I teach this Dharma to others, but then he says that I tell them to go south, but they go west. So what can I do? So he's asking that question. <laughs> Um, so, I want to go back to that previous sutta. It has some interesting details what he did after the awakening. I attained the un. Uh, okay. Then, because beings myself subject to birth. Having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeking the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. I attain the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. I being myself subject to aging, having understood the danger in what is subject to aging, seeking the unaging supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. I attain the unaging supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, being myself, to subje myself subject to sickness, having understood the danger in what is subject to sickness, seeking the unailing supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. I attain the unailing supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, being myself subject to death, having so... <coughs> I attain the undefiled supreme security from uh, bondage, Nibbana. The uh, knowledge and vision or arose in me. My deliverance is unshakable. This is my last birth. Now there is no renewal of being. He found the answers. <coughs> but then he had this question. I considered this Dhamma that I have attained is profound, hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning. This is why we tell you stop thinking, six are that thinking, stop giving yourself a Dhamma talk in your head. Because <laughs> all that you know, you try to say, oh, this must be it, this must be that, so then you go back down. <laughs> Unattainable by mere reasoning, the Buddha says this. <laughs> Subtle, to be experienced by the wise. By this generation, delights in attachment, takes delight in attachment, rejoices in social media. It is hard <laughs> attachment. Same thing. It is hard for such a generation to see this truth, namely, see so people ask why people are not enlightened, why, why, don't, why we don't see arahants, so this is why. It is hard for such a generation to see this truth. They didn't even have social media at that time. Imagine how poor we are now. <laughs> It is hard for such a generation to see this truth, namely specific conditionality, dependent origination. And it is hard to see this truth, namely the stilling of all formations, sabba sankara samatha, the relinquishing of all acquisitions, sabbhupadi patinisagga, the destruction of craving, tanhakkaya, Dispassion, Viraga, Cessation, Nirodha, and Nibbana, Unbinding. If I were to teach the Dhamma, others would not understand me, and that would be wearying and troublesome for me. Thereupon, there came to me spontaneously these stanzas never heard before. Enough with teaching the Dhamma that even I found hard to reach for it will never be perceived by those who live in lust and hate. Those died in lust, wrapped in darkness, will never discern this abs abs 
abstruse dhamma which goes against the worldly stream subtle see against the stream subtle deep and difficult to see gambiro duddaso duranubodo subtle deep gambiro is uh, deep subtle difficult to see is duddaso subtle is duranubodo hard to realize considering thus my mind inclined to inaction rather than to teaching the dhamma so he can exp- he can sense the tiresomeness but did he have any aversion toward it no he just re- you know, thought how difficult this can be <coughs> then brahma sahampati knew with his mind the thought in my mind and he considered the world will be lost the world will perish since the mind of the buddha accomplished accomplished and fully enlightened inclines to inaction rather than to teaching the dhamma then just as quickly as a strong man might extend his flexed arm or flex his extend extended arm the brahma sahampati vanished in the brahma world and appeared before me so i i imagine this to be like that like that quickly he so s- wherever someone appear disappears from here and appears somewhere else this is the stock phrase you find in the suttas he arranges his upper robe on one shoulder and extending his hands in reverential salutation towards me said venerable sir let the blessed one teach the dhamma let the sublime one teach the dhamma there are beings with little dust in their eyes who are wasting through not hearing the dhamma there will be those who will understand the dhamma the brahma sahampati spoke thus and then he said further in magadha there have appeared till now impure teachings devised by those still stained open the doors to the deathless let them hear the dhamma that the stainless one has found just as one who stands on the mountain peak can see below the people all around so o wise one all seeing sage ascend the palace of the dhamma let the sorrowless one survey this human breed engulfed in sorrow overcome by birth and old age arise victorious hero caravan leader deathless one and wander in the world let the blessed one teach the dhamma there will be those who will understand so here all seeing is explained but why didn't he see this that there are beings out there with little dust in the eyes he is still reasoning out he just did not pay attention to it and why did bahma sahampati had to remind him this is a big question you know you find that india is brahma society they worship this brahma if he is the one inviting the buddha <laughs> who are you guys right so that <laughs> so this is very subtle here that um, it, it may have that meaning but i'm not completely sure i'm just saying that because the you know, people be, people worshiped him as the creator god brahma Uh, and that is kind of uh, not the case in the buddha's dispensation he he is above all those then i listened to the brahma's pleading and out of compassion for beings i surveyed the world with the eye of the, a buddha so buddha has this eye buddha chakku surveying the world with the eye of a buddha i saw beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes with keen faculties and with dull faculties with good qualities and with bad qualities easy to teach and hard to teach and some who dwelt seeing fear and blame in the other in the other world like afterlife just as in a pond of blue or red or white lotuses some lotuses that are born and grow in the water 
strive immersed in the water without rising out of it. So just like a pond. I saw beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes, with keen faculties, easy to teach and hard to teach, and some who dwelt seeing fear and blame in the other world. Then I applied to the Brahma Sahampati in stanzas. Open for them are the doors to, de to the deathless. Let those with ears now show their faith, thinking it would be troublesome. O Brahma, I did not speak the Dhamma subtle and sublime. So he responds to Brahma Sahampati that I didn't see that far yet. But I see, yeah, there can be beings who are not so infatuated with lust and so on. Then Brahma Sahampati thought, the Blessed One has consented to my request that he teach the Dhamma. And after paying homage to me, keeping me on the right, he thereupon departed at once. I, did, I considered, to whom should I first teach the Dhamma? Who will understand this Dhamma quickly? It then occurred to me, Alara Kalama is wise, intelligent. See, some little dust in his eyes. And discerning, he has long had little dust in his eyes. Suppose I taught the Dhamma first to Alara Kalama. He will understand it quickly. Then deities approached me and said, Venerable Sir, Alara Kalama died seven days ago. And the knowledge and vision arose in me. Alara Kalama died seven days ago. I thought Alara Kalama's loss is a great one. If he had heard this Dhamma, he would have understood it quickly. So he does not have a physical body out there to hear this teaching, even if the Buddha were to approach that place, that he is in a mind realm only, which does not manifest a physical form. I considered thus, to whom should I first teach the Dhamma? Uddhaka Ramaputta is wise intelligent and discerning. He has long had little dust in his eyes. He will understand it quickly. Then deities approached me and said, Venerable Sir, Uddhaka Ramaputta died last night. And the knowledge and vision arose in me. Yeah, he died last night. It's a loss. It's a great loss. If he had heard this Dhamma, he would have understood it quickly. I considered thus, to whom shall I first teach the Dhamma? Who will understand this Dhamma quickly? It then occurred to me, those friends who abandoned him. Because of the group of five who, atten who attended me while I was engaged in my striving. Such gratitude, huh? They were very helpful to me. Suppose I teach the Dhamma to them. Then I thought, where are these monks? And with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw that they were living at Benares in the deer park at Isipatana, not caring what happened to their friend. <laughs> then, monks, when I had stayed at Uruvela as long as I chose, so he spent seven weeks reflecting on what he had realized, um, staring, showing gratitude to the Bodhi tree, that is how it is perceived, but reflecting deep Dhamma, not blinking his eyes. You can see that place when you visit Bodh, uh, Bodh Gaya. Um, we, we went to see that. I set out to wander by stages to Benares, Varanasi between Gaya and the Palace of Enlightenment, right, Benares. Between Gaya and the Palace of Enlightenment, sorry, Place of Enlightenment, the Ajivaka Upaka saw me on the road and said, friend, your faculties are clear. The color of your skin is pure and bright. Under whom have you gone forth, friend? Who is your teacher? Whose Dhamma do you pro profess? I replied to Ajivaka Upaka in stanzas. Ajivaka is also like a wandering ascetic. I am one who, so this is Buddha's resp response. The lotus comes here. 
I am one who has transcended all, a knower of all, unsullied among all things, renouncing all, by cravings ceasing freed, having known this all but for myself, to whom shall I point as teacher? I have no teacher. In fact, his teachers now passed away. And one like me exists nowhere in all the world, with all its gods, because I have no person for my counterpart. I am the accomplished one in the world. I am the teacher supreme. I alone am a fully enlightened one, whose fires are quenched and extinguished. I go now to the city of Kasi to set in motion the wheel of Dhamma. In a world that has become blind, I go to beat the drum of the deathless. By your claims, friend, you ought to be the universal victor. The victors are those like me who have won to destruction of taints. I have vanquished all evil states. Therefore, Upaka, I am a victor. So the Buddha does not say it here, but in another place he says, I am like a lotus, Pundarikang Yata Vaggu. I am not smeared by the water. I am not smeared by karma, sensual lust. Therefore, I am the Buddha. But at this point, look at his response. When this was said, the Ajiva Kupaka said, Meh. <laughs> May it be so, friend. Shaking his head, <laughs> shaking his head, he took a bypath and departed. Yeah. He just didn't get it. <laughs> he expected somebody's name as a teacher, so not prepared to get a profound answer like that. <laughs> yeah, I think if you become a Buddha, let's not say that to everybody. Else. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, yeah. Like, I am awakened. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody understands that really. Exactly, yeah. Little dust, really no dust. <laughs> I mean, full of dust <laughs> in this case. <laughs> He's in a dusty road too. <laughs> then because wandering by stages, I eventually came to Benares, to the deer park at Isipatana, and I approached the bhikkhus of the group of five. The bhikkhus saw me coming in the distance, and they agreed among themselves, friends, here comes the recluse Gautama who lives luxuriously, <laughs> <laughs> who gave up his striving and re reverted to luxury. We should not pay homage to him or rise up for him from the seat or receive his ball and outer robe. This is a practice still being done when a monk visits with his ball and outer robe. Uh, one of the attending monks would receive the ball and then uh, put it in the position of the seniority. So that is where the seating will be arranged and will show where things are, where the bathroom is and so on. <coughs> but a seat may be prepared for him. They, will s they s decided, okay, we'll give him a chair to sit. <laughs> if he likes, he may sit down. However, as I approached, those bhikkhus found themselves unable to keep their pact. One came to meet me and took my ball and outer robe. Another prepared a seat and another set out water for my feet. However, they addressed me by my name, by name as a as friend. Thereupon I told them, monks, do not address the Tathagata by name as friend. The Tathagata is an accomplished one, like calling David, hi David, like that. The Tathagata is an accomplished one, a fully enlightened one. Listen, monks, the deathless has been attained. I shall instruct you. I shall teach you the Dhamma, practicing as you are instructed, by realizing for yourselves here and now, through direct knowledge, you will soon enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life 
for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. When this was said, monks of the group of five answered me this, Friend, Gautama, by the conduct, the practice and the performance of austerities that you undertook, you did not achieve any superhuman states, any distinct distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Since you now live luxuriously, having given up your striving and reverted to luxury, how will you have achieved any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones? When this was said, I told them, the Buddha does not live luxuriously, nor has he given up his striving and reverted to luxury. The Tathagata is an accomplished, accomplished one, a fully enlightened one. Listen, monks, the deathless has been attained. The second time, third time, they were not getting it. I was able to convince the monks of the five, so after the third time, oh, he says, when this was said, I asked them, because have you ever known me to speak like this before? Just pay attention to what I'm going to say. I have something to share. No, Venerable Sir, because the Tathagata is an accomplished one, a fully enlightened one. Listen, monks, the deathless has been attained. Now, uh, through your direct knowledge, you will soon enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of your holy life. I was able to convince the monks of the five. Then I sometimes instructed two monks while other three went for food. The six of us lived on what those three monks brought back from arms round. Sometimes I instructed three monks, while other two went for arms, and the six of us lived on what those two monks brought back from their arms round. Then the monks of the group of five, thus taught and instructed by me, being themselves subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeking the Unborn, unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, attained unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. So, uh, and then the jhana is taught here. Um, I will go over the first sermon he gave, and just briefly, uh, 1843. So, this will, this will show... Um, what he actually did. This is called setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was dwelling Baranasi, Baranasi in the deer park at Isipatana. There <coughs> the Blessed One addressed the monks of the five uh, thus. Monks, these true, two extremes should not be uh, followed by one who has gone forth into homelessness. What two? The pursuit of sensual happiness in sensual pleasures, which is low, vulgar, the way of whirlings, ignoble, unbeneficial, and the pursuit of... Uh, okay, so, low is hino, vulgar is gammo, the way of whirlings is potu janiko, ignoble is anario, unbeneficial is anatta sanghito. So he gives... For for a sensual pleasure, he gives one, two, three, five, six, seven, I would say, adjectives. And then the pursuit of self-modification, which is painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial. Only three. Dukko, anaryo, anatta, sanghito. Painful. So dukkha is there. Painful. Difficult to bear, right? Without veering towards uh, either of these extremes, the Buddha has awakened to the middle way, which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. <coughs> so then he declares, now 
this is the no noble truth of suffering birth is suffering so look at the eight things he includes into the suffering section birth is suffering let's count to make sure it's eight aging is suffering illness is suffering death is suffering union with what is displeasing is suffering separation from what is pleasing is suffering not to get what one wants is suffering in brief the five aggregates subject to clinging are suffering how many are there eight yeah eight things thank you now <coughs> monks this is the noble truth of the origin of suffering it is Suffering arises because of craving, which leads to renewed existence, accompanied by delight and lust. Nandi raga sahagata, seeking delight here and there. Tatra tatra abhinandini, craving for sensual pleasures. Kama tanha, craving for existence. Bhava tanha, craving for extermination. Vibhava tanha. Now this is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. It is the remainderless fading away and cessation of that same craving, the giving up and relinquishing of it, freedom from it, non-reliance on it. So, now there is tasayeva tanhaya asesa viraga nirodho chago patinisago mutti analeo. So the word name analeo comes from here. Analeo is non-reliance on it actually like no attachment so <clears throat> it's like you are on a parachute and mm, you have only a lunch pack and the parachute goes up and up and up and you want to go further what do you do you let go of the lunch pack but then it goes little further you want to go further what do you do you jump it goes further <laughs> Just complete letting go. So it's like stage by stage, you can see here, uh, remainderless fading away and cessation of that same craving, the giving up um, and relinquishing of it, freedom from it, non-reliance on it. Mutti, freedom, analeo, actually non-attachment, chago, letting go, six are in. Patinisago, non association. So I would translate analeo as non attachment. Alea, like Himalaya, is where snow is, Hima is. Okay? Alea is like where there is so much of it, attachment, so much of it. So analeo is na alea, no attachment. Okay? Now, <coughs> this is the noble. Uh, This is the noble truth of the way lead into the cessation of suffering. It is the noble eightfold path. You know the noble eightfold path. So then he says very uh, something interesting. This is the noble truth of suffering. Thus monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. Chakkum udupadi, jnanam udupadi, vijja udupadi, panya udupadi, aloko udupadi. Monks recite this all the time. This noble truth of suffering is to be fully understood. Look what you are supposed to be doing with the first truth. This noble truth. So everything has just the knowledge of the truth and what should be done and the knowledge that it has been done. Okay, each truth has 12, th 12 aspects of it. How does it happen? Now you have four truths, the knowledge of the truth, what should be done and that it has been done. Okay. Four into three is 12, 12 aspects of it. We have a maths person here. <laughs> so he is now de declaring, de uh, declaring it. This noble truth of suffering is to be understood. All those aspects of suffering. In regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. This noble truth of suffering has been fully understood. Thus, 
in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, and true knowledge and light. This is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. That's the craving. This origin of suffering is to be abandoned. Craving should be abandoned. This, this is the noble truth of cessation of suffering. That is one thing. This noble truth of cessation of suffering is to be realized. See what should be done with the cessation. It is to be realized. This noble truth of cessation of suffering has been realized. Then the knowledge arose. This noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering, then this knowledge arose in him. And then this noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering is to be developed. The Eightfold Path is to be developed. This noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering has been developed. That knowledge arose in him. In him. So long because as my knowledge and vision of these four noble truths as they really are in their three phases and twelve aspects was not thoroughly purified in this way, I did not claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devas, maras and brahmas, in this generation with its ascetics and brahmins, its devas and humans, but when my knowledge and vision of these four noble truths as they really are in their three phases and twelve aspects was thoroughly purified in this way, then I claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devas, mara and brahma in this generation with, with its ascetics and brahmins, its devas and humans. The knowledge and vision arose in me. Unshakable is the liberation of my mind. This is my last birth. Now there is no more renewed existence. That is what the Blessed One said. Elated, the bhikkhus of the group of five delighted in the Blessed One's statement. And while this discourse was being spoken, there arose in the Venerable Kondanya the dust-free, stainless vision of the Dhamma. Whatever is subject to origination is all subject to cessation. Yankinchi samude dhammang sabbang tang nirod dhammang. Whatever arises, they pass away. No permanent anything, self or anything. Only one un one person understood. It took them. It took him to teach the non-self characteristics called anatta lakkana sutta. That's the second. That's known as the second sermon. To um, liberate all five. Kondanya is the first one to understand it, just barely hearing the four truths. So, um, and when the wheel of the Dhamma had been set in motion by the Blessed One, the earth-dwelling Devas raised a cry, and then many, many Devas. It, and so having heard the cry of the earth-dwelling Devas, the Devas of the realm of four great kings raised a cry. and. Having heard the cry of the Devas, the realm of the four great kings, the Tavatinsa Devas, the Yama Devas, Tusita Devas, Nimanarati Devas, the Paranimita Vasvasti Devas, the Devas of the Brahma's company raised a cry at Baranasi in the deer park at Isipatana. This un unsurpassed wheel of the Dhamma has been set in motion by the Blessed One, which cannot be stopped by any ascetic or Brahmin or Deva or Mara or Brahma or by anyone in the world. Thus, at that moment, at that instant, at that second, the cry spread as, as far as the Brahma world, whole universe is aware. And this 10,000-fold world system shook, quaked, and trembled. And an immeasurable, glorious radiance appeared in the world, surpassing the divine majesty of the Devas. Then the Blessed One uttered this inspired utterance. Kondanya has indeed understood. Kondanya has indeed understood. In this way, Venerable Kondanya acquired the name Anya Kondanya, Kondanya who has understood. <laughs> okay. Not bad. <laughs> so.
sorry for combining many pieces uh, to get that far. At least we kind of have an idea why he is called the Buddha and what actually happened. So it's scattered in the suttas depending on who asked what question and what he was interested in sharing. So you have to, many other suttas has some other small details that you can, you can also go to Udanas to see like what a Sambodhi section has what he actually reflected upon, how he reflected on the dependent origination up, you know, on the first watch of the night and the second watch of the night, the cessation, and then both cessation, arising and passing away phenomena, the cessation, you know, arising phenomena of dependent origination and the cessation phenomena. That's how all the pieces are put together, but ignorance comes first because of obviously many many beings are not aware that we don't know that dependently arise in nature. We t either take the body to be self or there is a permanent self that there is this and that, all of, all of that. So um, it's good to read those when you have the time, uh, start with the n any Nikaya and get the knowledge if you are interested. Now you have a PhD in Buddha's awakening. <laughs> any questions? Um, they remain. You still feel until you. So there is two nibbana. So padi says a nibbana and anupadi says a nibbana. Sorry, when you pass away, when you pass away, it's like a candle. Can you find where the light went? There were conditions for them to burn, and now no more conditions, no more existence in anywhere. Within the cycle of yeah, as he declared. This is like a question he put aside. This doesn't help you. He, p he will put it as tapani a question. I'll put that aside. Just seek your own awakening and you will know. But he gave the candle simile, um, or I think Milinda Panya gave that simile, uh, which is a later uh, commentary <coughs> that was added to the Burmese canon. Yeah. Rahul. Uh -huh.